Very good. Little time to say thanks. So um, I will start my discussion by addressing Harald's criticism to the SG models, and then I'll turn to um, Marty's praise or defense of the DSG approach. I think the bottom line is that you really need the two to get to a balanced view. Starting with Harald. Harald tells us that inflation follows a seemingly exogenous statistical process unrelated to measures of slack. And he cites the work of Smets and Bauters, who find that most of the variation in inflation can be accounted for by uh, exogenous shocks to wage or price markups. Um, in Harald's words, inflation dances to its own music. This actually connects to a quite bulky literature that has documented the elusiveness or even disappearance of the Phillips curve, particularly in recent data. So Harald goes on to argue that this disconnect between inflation and measures of slack poses a big challenge to the new Keynesian framework, for which the Phillips curve is a key building block. Now, in my discussion today, I would like to ask a question, uh, does it really raise a problem? And the answer I will give is no, not at all. On the contrary, this disconnect between inflation and slack is precisely what a new Keynesian model with an optimizing central banker would predict. And to make my argument, I will use the exact same model that Harald uses, um, the textbook new Keynesian model in uh, Michael Woodford or um, uh, Jordi Galli. And as a measure of slack, I will also use the unemployment rate. So this is my central banker, this is the loss function. Pi t here is deviation of inflation from target, and ut um, is deviations of unemployment from the natural rate. So let me focus on the uh, solution under discretion. The central banker uh, minimizes the period by period loss subject to the new Keynesian Phillips curve. This is simply an, an aggregate supply relation that says that when unemployment increases relative to the natural rate, that puts downward pressure on wages and marginal costs and causes a uh, fall in inflation. <coughs> Epsilon uh, here is some random shock. You can think of the markup shocks in Smets and Bouters. The solution to this minimization problem is the targeting rule that says that when unemployment increases relative to the natural rate, the central banker should be ready to stimulate the economy, letting inflation rise above, it ta above its target potentially. So in this um, uh, graph here, I plotted the uh, two curves, the downward sloping Phillips curve and the upward sloping targeting rule. In equilibrium, we only observe the intersection between these two lines, so we face the classical identification problem. Uh, made worse by the presence of these uh, markup shocks that are shifting the, the um, Phillips curve around. Um, so if you're a naive an econometrician and run a simple regre regression between inflation and unemployment, you're very likely to identify the targeting rule rather than the Phillips curve. In order to identify the Phillips curve, we needed enough deviations from the targeting rule. Now, the model also tells us that in equilibrium inflation, we'll actually inherit the properties of the exogenous um, markup shock, the epsilon sh um, um, uh, shocks here. So in, in equilibrium, we should see inflation dancing to its own music, as long as central bankers, of course, are behaving sensible, sensibly and following a, a reasonable targeting rule. Um, this intuition goes through in the case under commitment. Um, and what I found surprising in, this, in reading this bulky literature on the Phillips curve is that these formulas have been around um, at least for 35 years since Byron Gordon, and yet it seems that the profession, at least empirical literature, has not pe been paying enough attention. So just to wrap up, the new Keynesian framework predicts that in equilibrium you should, we shouldn't see a correlation between inflation and slack, as long as central bankers are seeking to uh, sensible rules. Um, so the challenge here is more for econometricians, not for the model. In work I've, I've done with Michael McLee, we find that studies that are well identified tend to find that the Phillips curve is, is well al and alive. Um, turning from the urgent to the important, I'll, uh, I'll f fully agree with Harald on the need to improve the modeling of asset pricing in DSG models and, and to incorporate fi financial frictions. And I think that's the turn that the literature has taken since, since the financial crisis, at least. So um, regarding the last issue on the Phillips curve, um, the Taylor rule, and um, Harald points to a strange feature of the model, namely a persistent 
expansionary monetary policy shock can result in higher nominal rates. Um, I think it's less strange if you plot the behavior of the real rate, which is falling persistently in his example. Uh, what we see here is that this um, uh, fall in the real rate, which is all that matters, by the way, in these models, is increasing because of the rise in inflation expectations uh, triggered by the shock. So this, in a way, underscores the importance of, or the power of expectations in this class of models. Uh, in practice, however, this uh, expectation channel is much weaker, relates to what uh, Laura was saying before. Um, and this is a reason why central bankers, like the Bank of England, um, use a model that deviates from rational expectations. This is a way to downweight a bit the future and make the model both more realistic and uh, better at fitting the data. Um, so let me now turn to uh, Marty's praise of the DSG approach. Uh, he argues, and I agree, that uh, DSG models are uh, useful to simulate and evaluate the effect of um, policies because they allow us to quantify different trade-offs, uh, assess general equilibrium effects, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, they are becoming better and better at forecasting, and they're very transparent. So in principle, you can see the limitations and scope. Um, proof that they are useful is that many central banks are using it. Uh, very constructively, I will add the Bank of England to his long list. I should say, though, that the DSG model at the bank is used in conjunction with many other models, 11 in total, that are not necessarily dynamic or stochastic or general equilibrium, but they are also very useful to interrogate the data and learn about what's going on. That on, on top of um, a lot of empirical analysis that is uh, often uh, model-free. So I would say that the DSG models as, are an important piece in, in a bigger puzzle. I would also like to uh, add the way I see them is as a work in progress. And I think they will probably always be work in progress as um, our economies and our understanding of the economies uh, keep changing over time. Um, and, and as do the data and our technical capabilities to solve the, um, the models. Can I have some water? Can I have some water? <laughs> Sorry, thanks. Uh, okay, so let me now turn to the SG models used for monetary policy analysis. Um, I, um, the key friction that breaks monetary neutrality in these models, uh, thank you, uh, is a nominal rigidity. And now, um, interestingly, most uh, micro studies on nominal rigidity have, have focused on price rigidity. However, in models like Cristiano Eichmann and Evans, the key rigidity that uh, um, has quantitative bite is the wage rigidity. Price rigidity, uh, rigidity does virtually nothing in those models. So in order to, um, to get quantitatively large effects of monetary policy on, on activity, on real activity, you need a, a, a wage rigidity. So I'll, I'll talk today about wage rigidity, and here I will draw on the work I've done with Giovanni Olivet at the Boston Fed. So back in um, 2003, we convinced the Boston Fed to add new questions to the wage book survey of New England firms. And uh, from those questions, we learned that 90% of the firms made changes on compensation once a year. More than 50% of the firms uh, took the decision in the fourth quarter of the calendar year. And typically, the changes will become effective at the turn of the year. Now, completely independently from the Radford survey of IT companies, this is for the whole of the, U the US, we learned also that 90% of the firms decided on pay changes at the end of the fiscal year. And for 60% of the firms, the fiscal year ended in December, whereas the remaining 40% was pretty evenly distributed. Um, now, to the extent that there is a link between the uh, timing of the pay decisions, pay reviews, and pay, pay changes, um, and, and the fiscal year end, we know more generally that for 80% of the firms in the Russell 3000 index, the fiscal year ends in December. So there is some suggestive evidence that uh, there is wage rigidity. The next question we, we ask is, does it matter for monetary policy? Is this allocative? And, um, and here's what we did. Um, so uh, 
there is a big spike clearly in the distribution of wage setting decisions in, in the fourth quarter of the calendar year. Now, this implies a differential degree of wage rigidity during the year. Early in the year, wages are mostly sticky because they've just been reset. So models of nominal rigidity would predict that monetary policy sh should have a larger impact on output and employment. Conversely, late in the year, wages are mostly f uh, fixed. I'm uh, sorry, um, late in the year, they're mostly flexible. They're about to be reset. And we should expect to see smaller uh, effects of um, monetary policy uh, on, on activity. So we tested this hypothesis, and we found it to be borne out by the data. In fact, almost all of the empirical relation between real activity and monetary policy innovations that people have documented using bars is driven by the response of real activity to monetary policy innovations that take place in the first two quarters of the calendar year, whereas there's virtually no effect from shocks that take place late in the year. So let me show you some um, plots. Um, so the strategy we follow here is very simple. We introduce quarterly dependence in an otherwise standard bar. Uh, this is a standard response of GDP to a 25 basis point in the Fed funds rate, uh, again using um, recursive identification. So what we see is that the response tends to be sluggish, ham-shaped, um, and very persistent with the uh, peak response uh, reach almost two quarters after um, the shock. Almost eight quarters after the shock, sorry. So this is what happens when we introduce quarterly dependence in the, in the estimation. So top left, you see the response of GDP to a monetary policy innovation, the same one, 25 basis point uh, cut in the Fed funds rate, uh, when the innovation takes place in the first quarter. Top right, you see the response when um, the shock takes place in the second quarter. And in the bottom, you see the responses to third and fourth quarter shocks. So what we can see here is that when the monetary policy innovation takes place in either the first or second quarter, the response of output is fast, immediate, and sizable, and the peak response is, is reached much earlier than in the standard uh, VAR response. In contrast, the response tends to be insignificant when the shock takes place um, in the second half of the year. Um, we then carry on this exercise in other countries. Japan was an interesting case because the seasonal cycle in Japan is very similar to the one in the US, but the wage setting process take, is very concentrated in the second quarter of the calendar year, during the Shunto. So we did a similar exercise, and this is what um, you see. This is a response of industrial production. Uh, to a uh, uh, fall in, in, in the call rate. So in, so in the solid line, you see the response, the standard response without quarterly dependence. The dashed line shows you the response when the shock takes place in the first quarter of the calendar year, when wages are flexible, just before the Shunto process. And uh, the dot and dashed line shows the response when the shock takes place after the Shunto in um, the third quarter. So again, we see these differential effects depending on the effective degree of wage rigidity um, at the time of the shock. Um, we carried out also the exercise in um, the big European countries, uh, Germany, France, and the UK. Uh, in there, there's a lot more staggering in wage setting decisions, big laps, lags between the decision, the timing of the decision, and the implementation of the changes. And in some countries like Germany, uh, there's a high prevalence of multi-year contracts. Uh, consistent with that, we didn't see much evidence of quarterly dependence in, in, in the VAR responses. So to um, sum up, so the, um, the, the quarterly dependence in, in the responses of, um, of real activity is consistent with the wage rigidity story. And I think um, the Cristiano Ackerman and Evans um, model is focusing on the right friction to break the monetary neutrality. I think the Cristiano Ackerman and Trabant will have more trouble fitting the quarterly dependent data. There's a lot of uh, um, forward-looking behavior in the bargaining protocol, so they'll have to temper that with some uh, human, um, human resource uh, constraints. Um, so just uh, summarizing uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, um, presentation, 
I think DSG uh, are, are a very useful framework to um, evaluate and simulate policies. They are one of many inputs in the analysis. Um, they are work in progress. We cannot get complacent because the economies are changing and changing fast. Um, there are many margins that need, need improving. And uh, Harald mentioned some important ones, uh, like asset pricing and fi financial frictions. I also have my own uh, wish list. Um, regarding micro foundations, um, I'm all for empirically grounded ones. Um, I, my worry is that time, sometimes when um, macroeconomists uh, micro fund the models, they, they tend to put a lot of rationality and forward looking behavior that sometimes is not uh, backed by the data. Um, will they hel help predict the next crisis? Only if the next crisis uh, takes a familiar shape, uh, but um, obviously not if uh, we are up for. Um, trade wars or uh, cyber attacks that are not currently in our models. So, thank you. <laughs>